Well, hello, everybody. We began a discussion on the topic of the Bible, and we talked the last time about the fact that the Bible has 73 books. The word Bible really should be translated in our minds as library, and each one of those books can be historical, poetic, it can be literal, it can be figurative. So whoever does the translation has to be careful that they go right back to the original sources and recognize that the language that we translate as we translate the meanings today has to accurately reflect what it meant at the time it was written, not what my opinion of it might be today. And that's why there are so many versions of the Bible. There are those who translate it according to their own uh, preferences and their own beliefs. So for example, if you were to look at the typical Bible today, the Catholic Bible has 73 books, as I mentioned the last time. If you were to look at a typical Protestant Bible, you would have 66 books. And why? Because at the time of the Reformation in the 16th century, Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk, a priest like me, disagreed as he was putting his theology together. He disagreed with seven of the books, so he eliminated them because it didn't fit into his theology. And we say, once the books have been accepted, and once the books have been pronounced as the Bible, you can't subtract and you can't add any books to it. Now, in our own day, relatively speaking, uh, there's a group of wonderful people known as the Mormons, and Joseph Smith <clears throat> believed that he had a vision in which he was told to share an additional series of readings, and it's called the Book of Mormai, or the Mormon Book of the Bible together. So we say, from our point of view, you can't take any of it out, you can't add to it, you have to understand it as it is, and you have to learn what it is. Now here's where there's a big problem between Roman Catholics and, for example, a typical Protestant and the reason for the disparity in the books. <clears throat> a good Protestant would say, only scripture, sola scriptura, which means if it isn't in my Bible, and if it isn't located in there, I don't believe it. It's gotta be in the Bible in order for you to understand that it's really Christian. And anything other than what's in the Bible, black and white, you should not believe. A Roman Catholic says, Scripture, yes, and tradition. Now, sometimes, as you've heard me say before, tradition with a small t means doing something every year as a way of life. So going to a relative's house for a holiday or uh, celebrating uh, an event with friends the way we do every year, that, that becomes a tradition, becomes part of that person's uh, cycle of life. But tradition with a capital T, if you take the N off, you have the Latin word traditio, which is the original sense of that word. It means to pass something on by word of mouth. So why do we believe in scripture and tradition? It's because tradition came before scripture. If you were to ask someone, Okay, here's your Bible. Where did it come from? Did it just fall out of the sky? God gave it to us like it is? Obviously not. Where did it come from? Well, from the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is, take a look. You and I know the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But <clears throat> there are many other Bibles and many other books the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of the Egyptians, the Gospel of Peter, Nicodemus, Philip, Matthias, Andrew, Thaddeus. And that's just to name a couple. There were many, many, many writers that wrote Gospels and books that they considered to be Christian writings. Uh, some years ago, you may recall, there was a movie out called The Da Vinci Code, in which, you know, they were saying the Vatican the Pope, they're hiding books of the Bible from us. Well, guess what? Nobody's hiding those books. You can go to any library and see any of those Gospels. Here's a book 
known as a Petrology book, written in 1962. And it has many of the Gospels that I just mentioned right here. So the question was, and the question is, which of these books are really the ones that were inspired by God? So who's going to make that decision? Should you sit down and read every one of these and then decide for yourself without knowing the history, when they were written, what the language of the day was? No. That's why the early church went through a period of discernment. So if you said to a Christian, um, after the time of Jesus, could I see your Bible? They would look at you with a quizzical look. What do you mean, my Bible? Or if you said to St. Paul, where's your Bible? Let me see your Bible. He would have looked at you like you had three heads. Because the Bible went through a period of discernment. Now remember, for the first 300 years after the time of Jesus, Christianity was forbidden. And if you were a Christian, you could be martyred, you could use your life. Until the year 314, when the Emperor Constantine published an edict called the Edict of Milan, in which the Emperor gave religious freedom to all religions. So you could practice Judaism, you could practice the ancient Roman religion, you could practice Christianity, and he became a Christian. And once the Christians were given their freedom, then the question was, how can we stay organized? Now, over those 300 years, the word of Scripture, the teaching of Jesus, was passed on by word of mouth. There was no one Bible. There was no one place where you could go to read the Gospels. And so tradition, passing on the faith by word of mouth, came before the written word. The spoken word, the written word. The written word was taken from the spoken word. In other words, for 300 years, the Christians passed on the teaching of Jesus by word of mouth. And how was it kept together to make sure that it was not in any way uh, <clears throat> compromised? Because the structure of the Christian community was the apostles were overseeing the local communities. Once there was persecution and they spread, they spread the gospel. But they would keep in touch. So if you read in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, you read about the first church council called the Council of Jerusalem, held in the year 4950 AD, just right after the time of Jesus. So if you say that Jesus died in 33, approximately, and the Council of Jerusalem was in the year 50, you're talking 17 years when the apostles came together and had to make a decision. Do you have to become Jewish before you become a Christian? The church had its first council. And it was through the councils of the church that the discernment began. And the discernment was which books belong as part of the sacred scripture and which do not. So what's interesting is that even though some people say only scripture, once you pick up the Bible and you say, this is what I believe in, what you're believing in is the authority of the church. You're talking about the first overseers of the church in the original Greek, episkopoi, in English, episcopal or bishop, overseer. They were the ones who gathered, as did the apostles, various times throughout the history of the church. We just had the Second Vatican Council where all the bishops from around the world came to decide certain matters to bring things up to date such as our liturgy. And when the bishops began to meet, they began to discern which books, which, which, which writings really belong in the sacred tradition that we believe in. So when someone says, I only believe what's written in the Bible, what they are saying is they believe in the authority of the church because the church was the, the one that took all those books, studied them, deciphered them, discussed them, and then made final decisions. So we're going to stop here. And the next time, 
I'm going to turn you into a scripture scholar. I'm going to help you understand that if you were a bishop at the time of the early church, how would you decide what was actually authentically the teaching of Jesus and what should be in the Bible as we know it? We'll talk about that the next time. And for now, I say, may Almighty God, with his word of blessing, watch over you and keep you in his care. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.